Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 357 for Monday, September 12th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show that is by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in, where am I? No, Napomo, California. It's Paul Kent. I don't know. I never know where you are. I had to pause as I was saying the date today because uh, I realized as I was saying September 12th that, that this would have been Neil Peart's 70th birthday. It I was going to surprise you and, and 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 see if you knew that today. I did know that today. Uh, it the, the an very interesting thing is that it also is the thirtieth anniversary of the first date that my wife Lisa and I uh, took together. So is that coincidental or is that yeah was very, that planned? I was. I'll know it. Well, I mean, <laughs> it has nothing to do with the late Mister Peart. Uh, I was. She was. <laughs> I, I joke that she's the groupie gone awry. You know, you're not supposed to marry the groupie. Uh, she was coming to a bunch of our gigs. I, I'll, I'll, I'll spare everybody this story about how we met on a bus, but uh, maybe I'll share that another time. But she was coming to a bunch of our gigs and we would hang out like at set breaks and things like that. And I was supposed to play a gig at Apple's Cafe in Stamford, Connecticut, where a place where the band I was in, Go Figure, played a bunch and like on the Tuesday of that week or something, we were supposed, I think it was a Saturday night, uh, we were supposed to, we, we got word that the gig had been canceled by the club for some reason. I, I, I can't tell you why, you know, um, Eddie, the guy mm -hmm. that owned it was, was kind of, he was, he was a good guy, but he was sort of manic all the time. So there were constant like changes and things like that, but it was fine. So I thought, oh, I got to let uh, Lisa know. Now this was, you know, before the days where, people other than nerdy Dave had internet access. And so I looked, I guess I looked at our mailing list, which I maintained on my computer, like our snail mailing list. And then I, I used that to look up her phone number and called her. And um, I, I told her, I, you know, we weren't going to be playing. And I said, well, but what, maybe we should get together. So we went and had Indian food and uh, the rest, as they say is, uh, has been a wonderful history. So yeah, there you go. You, you do have an awesome wife, man. I uh, thank you for saying that. And I agree wholeheartedly. I am a fortunate. I, I lead a charmed life and that is, but one part of it, one big part of it. Yeah. I, um, did you play gigs this weekend, Paul? I had one freaking fantastic gig this weekend. I drove up and we played a festival. Something crazy has happened in the last two or three festivals. We've all of a sudden perfected getting 10 guys on stage, mic ready to go in about 23 minutes. It's the last two or three times we've had to do this. It has been butter, butter, butter. I don't know what it is. Might be the in ears, but um, yeah. But uh, geesh, it's been great. So anyway, we play. We we got the stage. We were kind of the headliner for the day. Great crowd. Great weather. It had been very, very hot up in the Bay Area, uh, and it broke a little bit. It was kind of. East Coast weather, you know, it was like I do know, 80s. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, gray, gray sky, you can feel the air pretty clear. It, very foreign in California, they call it earthquake weather for some reason. But oh. um, yeah, I, I don't know why that is. It's a, but it's um, a whole different kind of loaded thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but uh, we we were just great. I mean, I was, you know, I I will say when we were not at our best. Sure. Uh, and, and I'll say when it's just an average gig or a good gig. And, and you know, usually we, we, we're pretty good most of the time. I'm, you know, it, it, we, I've told you, we've been butter for a pretty long time. Then we took a little detour from butter. And I got to say, we're getting back to butter. But this was really, it was fun. The band sounded big. You know, I always like, the band before us was a good band, a well-known local band. Um, great uh, female front singer. Um, and they're very good. And they get a lot of corporate work. And um, whenever there's a band like that, very polished before us, we're a different style, right? And so we have to come out and kind of really be us. You know, we have to really just have that big 10-piece sound, energy. You know, that's how you, that's to me how you differentiate my band 
from a band with an awesome female singer, you right. know, cause they cover a lot of ground. Right. Yeah. So how do we be, how do we be a great dude band? And, uh, we just came out and we crushed it and we just, we owned That's it great. two straight hours, no break. And it was great. That's awesome. That's great. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. I'm glad to hear that you're getting the logistics down too. I had some, uh, interesting logistics this weekend. I, well, I, I, I said I'd lead a charmed life and it's true. One of actually two of the things that make up that charmed life is I play in two fantastic bands right now with mm -hmm. uh, we've got great players, great songs, just like and I got to play with both of those bands this weekend. That being Bitter Pill on Friday night and Fling on Saturday night. Bitter Pill's gig was at a uh, this brewery place down in Alston, Mass, just kind of the like on the outskirts of Boston. And it was it was great. There was a great sound engineer there. The The gig was great. We had to play seven to 10. So we did three 45 ish minute sets and it was a pretty laid back thing. It's a brew, like a food truck and stuff. And it's a cool little vibe outside. And uh, the third set, we wound up kind of stretching things a little bit. I, stretching might be the, the wrong word, but we wound up, we were very comfortable and we wound up playing some things and playing around with some things in some really interesting ways. I, I think it was really good for the band to feel that relaxed on stage a, as a counter mm. to like the festival gigs where, you know, you're hurried to get there and, and you, you know, you play your one set usually, uh, you know, and it's like, all right, we got to pack our best material. This was more like, okay, we've got to, we've got to think about the night here and be intentional so that, we're good all the way through and we're not leaving ourselves hanging at the end. And and we did a really yep. good job at that. I think like maybe that's really the lesson that we learned is, yeah, we can do this and we can, we can end and feel really confident all the way through the night. And, uh, and we did, everybody played really well. And, and like I said, and we played together. It was, it was fantastic. It really, really went well. Um, uh, and I, I came out of that gig on a high. It was just like, this is, this is how it should be. Um, and, and, you know, more like this, please. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it was good. Um, Saturday night fling played a, a, an outdoor venue, not quite the same vibe, but you know, similar enough where people are just hanging out here in how long since fling performed. Uh, it's been two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was longer. No, we played that that library benefit like th that was on the other side of the state or something for the kids or something like that. So yeah, it's been it's just been a few weeks, and um, so we went into this gig, but it was also a seven to ten, and I was at, we had uh, an opening band that was supposed to play with us, and then earlier this week we found out uh, that they couldn't, and so uh, we were we we began the process of sort of scrambling to find another opening band. And, and, it, and at that point I was like, wait, 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 let's not like, let's, let's just play. We can, we can cover seven to 10. We'll throw in some extra covers and stuff. I've actually been having fun with the fling set list. We have, we basically have, you know, two solid sets of originals and uh, we throw in some covers throughout the night. But what's really great because fling has this deep catalog of covers is we're playing the same originals every time we play because if, as long as we're doing a two set night, if it's, if it's a one setter, then we can, you know, sort of pick and choose and, and move it around a little, but otherwise we're playing the same originals uh, every night, which is fine. You know, that that's, that's kind of how it works at, uh, at this stage of the, the evolution. No, it's it, like, it's great. But what we get to do or what I get to do is the one crafting the set list is swap out the covers. So we like from gig to gig, if you come to see us two nights in a row, you will not get, or two, even two weekends in a row, you will not get the same covers peppered in through the set. And so that's kind of a fun way to, to mix it up and, and keep things interesting. And we're having yeah. fun with it. Yeah. And in addition to rearranging the, the flow of the sets, uh, you know, the, so it, it, that part of it's been really fun. And knowing that, and that being the one that crafts the set list, I felt very confident that we could very easily do a seven to 10 night, three forty five, just like bitter pill did. It would have been great. But uh, momentum kept things moving and, and we wound up with an opening band. And as we were coming into it, I realized, okay, you know, we're doing our own sound at this gig. And I realized thinking back as this was sort of unfolding, thinking back on, on gigs over the last, say, year uh, with Fling, where we do our own sound and have other bands, uh, 
that it it really becomes a an evening of not fun for me for a variety of reasons. Number one, I am the chief sound engineer, which means I have to get there. And and usually when we have a, a an opening band or a band playing with us, you know, we're using my drums. And so I've got to set up my drums, get things right, then move my snare drum and cymbals out of the way so the opening band's drummer can be there, set up all of fling sound, sound check the opening band, run the sound for the opening band. Then when they finish, I've got to, you know, cut the sound over to whatever fling needs. And thankfully we have enough inputs on the board. So even if they're using flings microphones, I literally move the, the inputs to empty channels for the opening band. So I'm not ever messing with what we've got going with fling, which is great. Um, but you know, I've got to cut all like save scenes and stuff like, you know, you I can save your board. Of yours. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, I've got the, um, I've got the Mackie board. I can save scenes for sure. But in a, in a time crunch scenario like that, there are all the doing it with scenes, regardless of the mixer. I've always found things where it's like, oh crap, I've made a change here to like the way the, the it, while I'm doing the sound for the, for the opening band, for example, I might uh, make a change to the way, say the kick drum is EQ. Now that's the same kick drum that's going to be, that's the one thing that doesn't cut over. Right. Cause it's, it's going to be the same kick drum or I'll make a change to the way the mains are EQ'd. Well, if I cut to a different scene, all that stuff is lost, right? Like I'm now going back to where it was. So it, it's just easier to move inputs and it, it's fine that, but you know, it's a thing that needs to happen. And then I need to reset up my drums and then it's like, okay, I got to play. And yeah. you know, there's no break in there, by the way, in case you, you know, in case you were counting along at home. <laughs> so it's, it's this thing where I said to the guys, I'm like, look, if we're doing our own sound going forward, like we'll do it tonight and it's, it'll be fine. And I'm in and I'll make it sound good. And like, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I've bought in for tonight. It's fine going forward. Uh, you know, if there's enough money, I'd rather on it, not. yeah, I'd rather yeah. not like, yeah, exactly. I said, look, if there's, I mean, if, if we're playing a gig with bitter pill, that's easy. Cause I know how to do the sound for both bands and guess what? I'm the drummer for both bands. So I like, I can get that rolling. That's fine. But, um, but otherwise it, it's like, it, you know, if we want to do this, if there's enough money on the table, hire a sound engineer and just let them do it. And then I'm, I love playing with other bands. I just don't want to have to be both the sound guy and the, you know, and the, uh, a lot of work. and the drummer. It's just a lot of, it, it really becomes a night of work, not a night of like fun and playing. And so it went fine. We didn't really get a sound check for fling because of the way we had to kind of set things up, which of course happens. And then, um, you know, and like halfway, well, even in the first set, my snare drum started acting weird, like the, the strainer on it, which is the thing that, that brings the snares up or, or, you know, brings them up against the bottom head to make it sound like a snare drum or drop, you drop them off and it sounds like a, you know, a Tom or whatever, uh, that started monkeying with me. And it actually monkeyed with me mo once at the bitter pill gig. I just noticed it had fallen like off. And so I pulled it back up, but it was really fighting me at this fling gig and I should have grabbed another drum because i have i as always i have a spare snare drum and uh at one point during the set i said well hang on i gotta i need to mess with this and so i messed with it for a couple of seconds and and then i realized one of my the left channel of my in-ears wasn't working and was like wait a minute like it worked 30 seconds ago before i messed with my snare drum and now it doesn't work and i still actually they're sitting right here i gotta go through that so it was just one of these nights of like, okay, man, like I, I'm never going to really get into it. I, I actually felt pretty good about my playing all, you know, all things considered, but it's tough to be in the, in the moment of a gig where you've got like technical glitches all over the place, which kind of a bummer. It really throws me off. I mean, I can definitely yeah. empathize with that. Yeah. Once sucks. your head is gone, cause you go, you're like, all right, what else is going to go wrong? Or, you know, you're, you're focused on that thing. Is it really fixed? Is it right? really fixed? Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I get it. Yeah. So it was just one and it, you know, it, it happened to be those two problems were not related to the fact that we had an opening band or any of that. Like those were just their own sort of things that chose to plague me on that night. But, um, but yeah, it was just like, man, it was so stacked up. By the time I got home, I was like, all right, whew, thank goodness that's over. You know, <laughs> like I made it. I survived. I'm back home. I have a couple of pieces of gear I need to take a look at before this weekend's gigs. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, made it through. But those are the things like you learn and, you know, there's there's. There, you get some content out of it for your podcast. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the glass 
half full type of guy. Ah, uh, you gotta find you gotta find the half full glass somewhere. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hey, um, we got an email from listener Jason, and this is somebody that we had uh, talked to and I think talked about on the show a while back, where he was asking our opinion on whether we thought it was a good idea to offer or agree to a discount for the first gig uh, in order to get your foot in the door so that you can earn, you know, your, your fair wage, your full wage down the road. And we shared our thoughts on that when, when this happened, Paul, back in January. And uh, today we got an email from Jason to feedback at giggabpodcast.com where he says, um, it seems like that strategy has really paid off. And it's a university affiliated venue, uh, if you don't remember from January, which I don't expect you all do. Uh, <laughs> it, and so this there was there was some reason to think that that this might work out. And he says, uh, so it's really worked out, though. I've had to do a little more wheeling and dealing than I like. The first booking last spring was the heavily discounted one. Their event was poorly attended. At least it seemed that way to us, though people reacted to us well, including the woman who booked us. She contacted us to play at a large charity event, which happened a few weeks ago. I quoted her our full, pl- full price, and she balked a little. After a little back and forth, I gave her a small discount on the charity event, which was the uh, same we gave to another nonprofit charity event. So they kind of used their own charity pricing for that in exchange for booking us for two of their football tailgates this fall at full price. In the end, it's proving to be a fruitful relationship. Uh, he says the charity event went well. And also got good feedback that there were so many different things going on that we were really just background music, except for a handful of diehard dancers. And based on some Instagram Instagram posts of their last football tailgate, those events may end up being similar. Load in and out is extremely inconvenient. Elevators with security passwords. Oh man, <laughs> I don't. Have you ever had to deal with a security password on the elevator for a gig, man? I don't know nope. what I have, man. Yeah. He says, but the money's now decent, at least. And I'm hoping at some point it will generate some more private event bookings from their members. Yeah, that's I've certainly found that with with the university gig. So I, I'm glad this really worked out, Jason. And thank you for following up with us. It's great to hear kind of the you know, we we get the beginning of a lot of these stories and it's nice to have the end of it or at least, a, you know, a check in in the middle of it. So, yeah, it was pretty yeah the, people just need innovative, you know, they got to figure figure it out, you know. Fine. I think the key to that story with Jason is, is that the, you know, like don't give money away needlessly. If, you know, if right. you have little to believe that it could lead to something else, then that that's just throwing money away. Right. But um, if they're, if you know enough about the client, you know that they do a lot of events, you know, the types of bands they like to do the events and you, you literally just got to get your foot in the door because they don't know you or you're, or how you're different from anybody else. It just makes so much sense. You know, play the long game. Yeah. But make sure you can see the long game, right? Like that. And and here, Jason clearly could like back in January, he, he believed he could see the long game. Really. He was coming to us for a sanity check, but uh, (laughs) I mean, I think so, you know, that's kind of how I, how I remember it, but yeah, I like, that's it. Yeah. Look at, look at the long game. Do you see one there? And it, you got to be careful not to employ too much wishful thinking in those situations. Oh, I, I do agree with that. And actually, there's one thing that was in his email that you just said about how response was good, right? Yeah. I, I always, I hear that and I think about how, I think about how many times I hear that, you know, people, people perceive they went over well. It's just a matter of convincing the booking person. Right. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about um, like confirmation bias, you know, like, yeah, like we really all as musicians really like to hear the people like our music. Right. Of course. And, and the ability for us to kind of take one good comment and I, I'm not saying Jason did this. I'm not saying that at all. No, in fact, his, saying, his, his comments were pretty realistic. He said there was, you know, it was a small amount of people paying attention, but the people that were liked it and including the booking woman, which is the key in those scenarios. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. I just, I find myself often, you know, art is one of those things where, you know, many people are fragile. I certainly am, you know, like I would be very sensitive to criticism and overly, uh, I, I would put way too much weight on on the good comments, right? Whereas, you know, probably if you were to take any realistic performance, you're probably, you know, 
you're on a scale. I'm not going to say you're somewhere in the middle. I'm going to say you're on a scale somewhere. So be careful about about the about the good comments coloring too much how something is. Yeah. And the same way, throw you know, if you get one bad comment, it doesn't mean the whole gig was bad. It means you got one bad comment. So <clears throat> confirmation bias when evaluating how you're doing or, you know, or, or being able to turn that into something that you can turn to a booker. I guess that's the most practical thing to say here. It's like, we went over well, people really liked it. We got a good reception. And, um, I would say, you know, who would go to a booker and say, well, the reception wasn't really good this time, but it was going to be really good next time. Yeah, right? but it's so going to be great. That's right. It's going to be great. Yeah. So, you know, the relative weighting, relative value of how you interpret and use um, positive feedback, I think is an interesting thing. I like that. Yeah. That's a good, uh, that's a good thing for us all to remember that, you know, it, you got to take all the feedback with, with appropriate yeah. grains of salt. Yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. Hey, um, speaking of feedback, I, uh, <laughs> I went and saw sting last night and, oh. and I, I have some things to share about it. What, what are your, th- what are your thoughts on, on sting here? So I like the police fine. Okay. And I haven't been a huge, I haven't been a tremendously big fan of, of Sting's solo work. I appreciate the musicality of it. I appreciate the quality of musicians who participate in Sting tours. Sting to me is, um, it's, it's just a little bit too far to the avant-garde side of, of rock music to be enjoyable for me. I think I've shared before. I'm not, I'm not a huge Steely Dan fan and not because I don't appreciate that they're cool songs, all that type of stuff. Mostly I just don't feel comfortable with, with, uh, art that people project their, their personal style onto. Okay. Does that make sense? I, I mean, I, other than that last bit, I'm not sure what that means. I feel like every artist is pr- projecting their personal style, mm-hmm. but, but I, I get what you're saying. Like, you know, St- Steely Dan Sting in their own ways are very much uh, in that sort of, you know, rock jazz fusion realm, even though most people probably wouldn't put them there, but yeah, you know, it's, it's um, it avant-garde is is a good word to use. I think there's or a good term to use. I, I think there's others, yeah. I, but I, I agree with you, right? I, I happen to like Steely Dan and Sting for exactly the same reasons that it doesn't appeal to you. And that's totally OK. Like that's I mean, that's but for some reason, Peter Gabriel does appeal to me. And so yeah. many prog things do appeal to me. Yeah. OK, so that's yeah, I would say you're right that Peter Gabriel's more in that prog side of pop music than Sting is kind of more in the avant-garde jazz side, although they could all be described as avant-garde, but yeah, I mean, no, that, that, I mean, listen, this is the beauty of art, right? You, we, we can both see the same thing in it and one of us can enjoy it and the other one cannot enjoy it. And we're both correct, right? Because we're talking about what we enjoy. So you, you said two things that really, strike a chord for me with the conversation that I feel like I, I need to share here. And that was that you appreciate the musicality and you appreciate the quality of musicians that play with these people, uh, especially, you know, sting. And I've seen sting a bunch and I've gotten every time I go to see sting, uh, every musician on stage is fantastic, especially the drummers. Right. I mean, you know, I can, I can go through stings, former drummers and use their first names only. And for most musicians, that's all I need, right? Because he had, well, he started with Stuart, right? And then he had Omar and Manu and uh, then Vinny for a very long time and then Josh and then Keith and uh, and 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 now he's on to this guy, Zach Jones, who I want to talk about. But, you know, like we're talking about Vinny Kalayuda and Josh Fries and Keith Carlock and Manu Kache and Omar Hakim and, of course, Stuart Copeland. These are, I, <laughs> I was texting with a, a drummer whose name I will not mention because you've all heard him play. Uh, but uh, I was texting with him after the show last night and his comment, the comment that he made was, was the best way I can say it. He says, yeah, sting needs to have a fire breather back there. And he, you know, my, my way of thinking about it is sting needs someone, a drummer playing the gig who can be respectful, obviously, but, 
who in in his own head and perhaps even quietly, although Stuart Copeland would be accepted here because it's a different relationship. He wasn't hired by Sting. He was, you know, in a band with him. But the drummer feels like they could be playing a better gig. Like not that there's anything wrong with Sting's gig, but they could play something far more technically challenging. Right. That's that's the kind of drummer that Sting always has. And I've come to trust that that's what I would see. And Sting would bring that. And last night, and in t- indeed for this entire tour, he's got this guy named Zach Jones, who is, I, he's a capable player. Um, he played almost no fills all night long. And, and this is, this is that last night wasn't an off night or anything. This is just how Zach plays. Uh, there was no flourishes or any of those things that you would expect out of a sting drummer. And there wasn't that tension of the drummer kind of pushing things while Sting was pulling things that makes really work for the police, but also kind of works for everything else that Sting has done. And so the show, like everybody else on stage was playing their ass off. And this guy was just playing. And it was a little weird watching this. Uh, It was, but we went, the four of us went, my wife and our two kids. And so I wasn't standing next to my wife. Our son was in between us. And usually we'll have like a little, I mean, we don't talk through the show, but you know, in song breaks or whatever, we'll have some comment or whatever to to share with each other. But we didn't talk at all through the show. So as we were walking out, she's like, I have thoughts about this drummer, but I really want to hear what you have to say, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like, he, Zach comes across as very much a songwriter's drummer. Like he was playing the parts to these songs that you would play if it was someone that had written it on an acoustic guitar and was showing you the tune and was just like, hey, come out on Friday night and back me up. Here's how the songs go, right? And and I was like, yeah, okay, fine. I play two and four and just like kind of, you know, play along and it'll be great. You know, it'll, I can, I can support that. Sure. But there wasn't the, 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 the yin and yang of sting versus it's always sting versus the drummer. I mean, I know they work together, but, but there's always a little bit of that tension there. And that wasn't there last night. And it was really kind of weird. I, like I, I don't get it. I don't understand why sting wants that kind of drummer with him after a career of playing with, you know, heavyweights. Who had this guy played with before? Not many people. Uh, I mean, he's done some studio work in New York. He played with, uh, I can't remember. There was a, uh, kind of a, a indie pop band, female singer songwriter kind of thing that, that he had some moderate success with. He played, he recorded drums on that album, uh, 57th and something, whatever sting did with Shaggy. Uh, I don't know, five years ago or something. He played on a couple of tracks on that. And I guess that, you know, that that's where the relationship began. And then earlier this year, Sting called him for the, for the road. So it was just kind of weird. And and I saw an interview with him uh, I, earlier this week, cause I, I was wondering, I'm like, wait, who am I going to get to see? Cause I thought it, for some reason I thought it was Carlock, Keith Carlock. And uh, because he did the most recent tour with Sting. And then Keith was, playing with um, uh, Krantz, Carlock, and Lefebvre uh, right here at, at Jimmy's place, believe it or not, on uh, that I talked about last week on the show. Mm-hmm. He played there Thursday night. I didn't get to go see him. And I thought, well, that's okay. He's playing there on his off night, and I'll see him on, on Sunday or whatever. And, it's like, and then I looked at their schedule. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to see him on Sunday. Who am I going to see? You know. And I found an interview with, with this that guy from back in July. And he said, you know, the, the interviewer asked him, how do you approach stepping into the shoes of, of giants, of you know, drumming royalty? And he's like, you know, I know that I can't play Vinny's part on like seven days like Vinny could because Vinny's the only one that's going to play it that way. He's like, so I have to interpret these songs my way, which, of course, that's a healthy thing. Great. Fine. And uh, he said that the band is really kind of loose about this in, in the sense of play whatever you want within reason. And if you don't hear anything, everybody's OK with it. You know, if, if there's some comment, then they'll come and talk to you and, you know, Dom or uh, Sting's guitar player has been with him forever or Sting will, you know, say, hey, hey, change this, do this differently or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know. It just, it was, there was no drive from the the drum stool. And like, if you can imagine police songs without the drummer, like on the edge of speeding everything up to the, you know, being too fast and without any energy. And 
it's just, it's a, it's weird. So I don't know. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, obviously let me put it this way. This is going to sound terrible if, as if the rest of this hasn't, by the way, uh, I have never been at a sting show before and thought I could do this better. Uh, <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I'm usually there watching like Vinny or, or, or Josh Freese or, uh, you know, and when I say Vinny, I mean, Vinny Kaliuta, I, you know, these are people that are like, so far beyond what I can do uh, that it's inspiring. And last night it was just frustrating. So I, weird. I mean, I, weird. Yeah. I, I assume stings aware of all of the things I've just said, like this it either is his desire or, or, you know, he's accepted it as his, as his lot in life at 70 years old. I don't know, but I know that he's, it's not lost on him, obviously. Like he knows what's going on mm -hmm. on stage and he knows who he hired and the guy's been with him since, you know, February or March or something. So it's not like he had, he, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I think you're, you'll probably get some mail about this, although. It, I'm sure I will. It'd be interesting. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if like on any Sting fan boards, if anybody else is, is, uh, is feeling it the same way. He, he played, uh, he played in New Hampshire here on Friday, on Saturday night, but I was playing with Fling. So I, we went to Maine last night on Sunday night to see him and the reports that came in from, you know, from friends, cause there were a lot of people around here that went to see him on, on Saturday. were like, yeah, the drummer, you know, he was okay, but uh, I don't know. It seemed like maybe he was laid back too much. Maybe they instructed him to lay back too much. It's like, well, from the interview, no, you know, they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it, what, one thing was interesting. They had had that song seven days, which is actually in five. And it's got a very interesting pulse in the, the kick and the snare play in five. And then the hi-hat sort of goes across the bar line. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, it is as Vinny Kalayuda as any drum part could get, right? Like that, it's yeah. just one of those things. And uh, that was one of the songs that he talked about in this interview from like July or something. And they had it in the set up until Saturday night and they swapped it out for spirits in the material world. Now, I don't know why, but you know, I mean, things happen through a tour. You decide to retire things and, bring other things mm -hmm. in but it was like as the show started i was like uh, how's this guy going to approach seven days like I, I don't even know like is this song like can he even do it like i don't know and uh but i didn't get the chance to find out so you know whatever it's weird it was weird i was rooting for him all night he, he rarely sort of delivered on on anything it was, oh, weird yeah it was weird it was weird yeah it, it, it was kind of a bummer to be perfectly honest because it was the, uh, every time I've seen Sting in the past, I've said, oh man, my daughter would love this. And, uh, and we did love the show. The rest of the band was on fire. He's got this harmonica player with him that is just outstanding. And, uh, two, well, depending on how you count it, somewhere between two and four people, uh, singing harmonies and they are all spectacular. Uh, and then of course it's, um, I can't remember Dom's last name, but his, his guitar player, but he's also got mm -hmm. Ruf, Rufus, Dom's son, uh, also playing guitar. And the two of them play, like everybody played great. Sting sounded great. It was, I mean, it was, it was an enjoyable show. It was just kind of weird. So sounds like it. Yeah. I'm curious to, to be told I'm wrong or to be told why <laughs> this, like if you have any, you know, info as to how this transpired, Send it to us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We will either share it or not share it if, uh, you know, depending on your wishes. I, w I would love to know. So. But to scale that back to, you know, like the world that we live in. Yeah. I was thinking that many bands are in the haste to get a band together. Are people picky or do you... Or you're just like just thankful to you know have find guys who have a, a a mutual willingness to pay to play. Are you the question? The esoteric question is answer it to yourself. Are you playing with? Are you if you were to do it again, would your would you be with the same guys that you're with now? And it's not you know anything to say out loud. <laughs> but, but. Yeah, I'm thinking of what my answers would be. This is interesting. Uh, so I will, I yeah. will speak about bands I'm no longer in. So any answers you hear are not about current, yeah. uh, you know, present, present band company, all excluded here. Um, I have, I have done both. I have been in bands that are 
formed out of let's let's say circumstance, right? You know, especially the mm. early the earlier in life bands uh, for the most part were were friends and we play music together. But even those, like there was a selection process of like, well, I, I would rather play with that bass player than than this guy or that guitar player than this guitar player. Or that singer is fantastic. It, you know, like those those kinds of things. I. It's hard to, but I have played in bands where it's just been, especially where I'm hired into the band. Uh, that's very much a circumstantial thing. Now, I mean, I have the. But you're choosing. But you I know, am you're choosing saying, you're, you're every not gig. Forming a band. Yeah. I'm right. thinking more about, yeah, maybe I should clarify this. I'm yeah, thinking more about when a band puts a, an ad, like a, a Craigslist ad or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So clearly your, your uh, circle. Of of, uh, of acquaintances hasn't yielded the right person for your group, and so you're going out and you're looking to the general public. And uh, if the guy or girl doesn't completely suck, do you take? Do you tend to give the gig to the first person because it's a you know you want that chair filled so bad? How picky are you in uh, in uh, you know testing some people? And we've done a few things. You know, in my time, we've been too hasty. Uh, and then we've had other times where we've, you know, been really diligent when we, when we replaced Joe, you yeah. know, we did, we did drummer auditions and who that was, you know, actually the, the one that we did the most with was uh, a trombone. When we did do a trombone player, audit, we had three real good guys come in and uh, we had a varying degree of votes for each of the three. And the reasons for the votes, you know, one guy would be, oh, that guy's chops were the best. One guy was like, oh, that guy's the best personnel fit for us. One guy was like, I don't think that guy showed what he could really do. I've seen him play. He can do, he can do more. Right. 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 And sure. uh, yeah. so, you know, it was all over the map as to how we came to who we finally give the gig to. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I do remember to your point about, you know, being hired into a band and then, uh, and I'm, I'm, pausing here because I'm trying to decide how how detailed I can get with this <laughs> without offending someone although I think I've actually told this story with great detail in the past so I, I'm just going to assume I'm safe uh, but I'm being hired into a band and then choosing realizing I was choosing to continue playing with them even though I, I didn't pick the other members and it was uh, the band I was in when I first came here to New Hampshire and it with the lineup that originally was in the band was fantastic. And then the bass player wound up not playing with that lineup anymore. And that, that was a whole weird thing, but uh, there was another bass player brought in and I realized that I was changing the way I approached the gig because I, of how much I didn't like playing with this person. It wasn't even that I didn't like playing with this person. I didn't like the way this person played. They were out of tune all the time and it was kind of a nightmare. I would set up my in-ears mix so that I could hear them less, you know, and uh, and I found that I would have like an extra drink before I went on stage to sort of <laughs> like I, I noticed it was, in all your head. it was in your head. It was in my head. Yeah. And it was like, wait a minute. Like I, I remember being at one gig and watching myself or just becoming aware of myself doing this. And it's like, wait, I do this at every gig. Why am I doing this? Like I, I'm, I'm missing my family. You know, my kids are growing up, and like, wh what is the point of this? And so it was at that gig that it, the nice part about that band was it was ne there was no commitment to one lineup from either side. You know, the person who ran it, nor from any of us musicians. That the only commitment was if you were offered the gig and you said yes, then you were, then you were going to play the gig on that date, whatever the date was, you know? And so I said, look, I know I'm in for, you know, the, the next two weekends or whatever, but uh, if it's, and I, I was very clear. I was like, if it's going to continue to be this bass player, just don't call me anymore. I said, it's just not my thing. <laughs> and and they were like, okay, that's fine. You know, it was fine. And then when they, they stopped playing with that bass player, I wound up playing with that band for another like three years or maybe even five years. Like it, it was, it actually worked out, but it was one of those things where I noticed like I, 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 I dislike playing with this person. That's different from I'm tolerating like they're fine, but they're not the best. Right. That's a, th that's a different thing. The different level of picky, I guess, <laughs> uh, or maybe. And it's, it's kind of a funny thing. So think about what it would take 
to make you dread doing something you love doing so much. Yeah, I, I, I experienced it. I know it's crazy. Yeah. 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 It was just ruining the nights for me is really what it was. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm a, first of all, I'm a drummer. If you, if you didn't know, uh, and so I'm locking in with the bass player all the time. So I, I've got to be paying attention to the bass, at least in theory. And then also in that band, I don't think I sang any leads in that band, but I was singing a ton of harmonies like I often do. And for me, my tonal reference for the harmonies by default is the bass. Like if, the, if I lose the bass, I, I, I mean, I can still sing harmonies, but it's like, oh, I'm not comfortable anymore just hearing it from the guitar or whatever. In an acoustic setting, it's different, right? But in a, in a rock band, it's just the way my brain works. I get my tonal reference from the bass. And so it's like mm -hmm. I was having to do all of this sort of compensation to be able to just deliver what I was there to deliver without having to listen to this dude on the bass that I didn't <laughs> care. It was out of tune. I mean, it was just like, Oh my God, all the time. Like I can't deal with this. I guess, I guess I'm, I guess I found where my level of picky was. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's, a, it's an interesting yeah. question though. I, I'd be curious to hear from you folks what your scenarios like that are. And, uh, but you know, what, what are, are you, are you choosing people? Where's your, where's your barometer? Right. I mean, I think this is, this is not a binary thing, right? You know, it's, there's a continuum here and, and where, where do you fall on the continuum either with your current band or if you have an interesting story about a past band or something, let us know feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We, we love to hear it just like you like to hear this stuff. Yeah. It's good conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now you got me really thinking. But the the uh, I'm not going to say anything about the bands I'm in. It was it was going to be all positive, but I, I wasn't. I'm not even. I, I promised. I, I said I wasn't going to open that door, so I'm not going to open the door. But it was it was going to be all good for the best. I think. I guess. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's good. I like I said at the beginning of the show. I and I mean it. Uh, you know, I lead a charmed life, and the two bands that I get to play with are are a huge part of that. So, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, man. What else we got? You're asking, you're asking interesting, well, you're prompting thing, good things tonight, Paul. We're deep, deep thoughts. Um, so the <laughs> house rockers have three gigs this coming. With, Jack, Jack, Han Paul coming Handy with would be you. Jack Handy would be your, your, you know, brother from another mother, I guess. I don't know. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we have a club date and then we have two more festival dates and then we're kind of done with the outdoor hmm. part of, of the year. And, um, I got a good topic for us to think about. Let's think about it and figure out how to dive in. Okay. I want to turn our, our set list over dramatically next year. We have limited re rehearsal time and I'm thinking about strategies for doing that. So, you know, there's a couple of things we have. We have a pretty deep set of songs. We talked about this before. We have a lot of songs, but if they're such great songs, they would still be in the set now. Right. So yeah. I'm not, you know, there, there are going to be some gems that we can pull back out. But limited rehearsal, you know, there's, there's, I think there's some simple songs, you know, that we could probably work up pretty quickly in the, you know, but I don't want it, I don't want it to be changed for the sake of change, but I think there'll be effective songs. But yeah, I, you know, we're going to spend our winter uh, playing a little bit less, seeing each other a little bit less, um, you know, maybe, maybe one week in a month, you know, December, January, February, maybe even to March. So uh, we don't, we don't have any holiday, uh, gigs booked. Do you have any holiday gigs booked? I don't think so. Oh, I mean, we've got, yeah, we've got a, a bitter pill gig, uh, actually two gigs on Halloween weekend that, uh, we're, we're going to, you know, any, any corporate Christmas parties or private Christmas parties? No, no, no public New Year's Eve. Nothing. I'm not, yep. I mean, I'll play New Year's Eve. I'm not a huge fan of New Year's Eve, you know? It's, you've, um, you've shared this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll do it. Like it's, it's not like I'm, I have some block against it, but it's also like, if I get an offer and it's the right one for the band or whatever, it's sure. Great. I'll do it. But other, I, I don't, I don't need a new year's Eve cake. For the sake, yeah, I get it. For the sake of, yeah, exactly. For punching that ticket. No, not, it doesn't matter Yeah. to me. Yeah. So a strategy, you know, I'll, I'll share what I come up with, but you know, some combination of digging deeper into the stuff that's worth a second try at, at, at making great. The thing is we, as a result of COVID, yeah. as a result of new guys coming into the band, as a result of not having much rehearsal time, we took our A-list of all time A-list stuff. And it's about, 
it's about three to four sets of of stuff. And that has whittled down when it's a two hour show to our A plus list. And it's just working. So you were talking about how your how your bitter pill, you know, you 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 will mix in a couple of things here. I am I am often dealing with my own boredom as balanced out by the great reception we get by doing these types of things. Or yep. the third the third dimension of this is just some desire to, you know, find that thing that not only puts a spark of electricity through the band on stage and then translates into something delightful for the people listening. Right. So there's to find that other thing that, that, you know, can just, you know, the freshness can bring. So um, thinking about those types of things. Yeah. I, so I, I obviously I'll say this just to make sure everybody we're all on the same page, but when you say you're, you're changing over the set list, you're, you're turning over the set list. You're really turning, turning over the song list. You're, you're, it's not just the order of the songs. It's the songs themselves are changing out. That's so right. I, and, and the order they will go in also the order, right? Yeah, of course. So my, my initial thought for you, and I realize this is intended to be sort of a, an overarching conversation and it will be, but my initial thought as you say that is all right, well, and this is me being, you know, me being me, this is how I would do it. Uh, is I would say, okay, let's pick the sacred cows right out of the gate, right? What are the songs that you're going to keep no matter what? And, and you, you have to come you and, or the band, however you're going to, uh, you know, choose to do this. You got to, fi- you got to put a fixed number on that, right? Like, okay, is it going to be 10 songs that we're, yeah, we're going to keep these and we're going to be playing these next summer. But you know, you've got to, you've got to look realistically, okay, how many songs do we play a night? Uh, how much of the song list do we really want to turn over? Is it, is it 70%? Is it 50%? Is it 90%? Right. So figure that out, find the ones. Okay. These are the ones that are sticking around. The rest have got to go. And I think obviously when it comes to, you know, may and you're about to start taking off, if you don't have enough other songs to fill for the set, I mean, you can always bring them back, right? Like you always know that there's every, everything yeah. is an experiment, but I think you, it would be healthy and productive to go into it knowing that, okay, we have, you know, 65% of the set that needs to be new. Let's get to work. Let's have this shared mission of creating that, you know, whatever that or learning, whatever that is so that it can actually be good and not just different for the sake of different. So, yeah, uh, you know, and, and, that might be the right way to kind of get everybody on the right page together and approach it. Like realistically, you're, you know, you're probably going to want the majority of them, like you said, to be uh, songs that are easier to learn. You might have one, two, three, maybe four songs that are a little more challenging, but you got to, you got to pick and choose your battles on those, right? So that you, yeah. you don't overstep or you don't, you know, bite off more than you can chew, I guess is the right way to say it. If, if there is even a right way to say it, but yeah, like that's, right. I don't know. Those are my initial sort of gut reaction thoughts, but. And it, it's, it's the eternal cover band question, right? I mean, I, I was telling you that the band who played before us was, was really good. Yeah. Uh, last Saturday, but they played a, a GB set. They played jump by Van Halen. They played, they played um, Jesse's girl. They played, you know, they played a GB rock set, right? Yep. We play a GB rock and soul set. And you know, if you if you say that there's a hundred songs in a GB book, and GB for those who are new is this concept Dave invented called general. Did oh, you invent no. that? General I, I, no, I didn't invent that. I learned that when I got here to New Eng- to Northern New England. I'd never heard it before, but yeah, it's general business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm I'm transfixed by the idea that GB exists, and and most working cover bands are are playing some majority of that, you know, whatever slant of that works and, you yeah. know, for their particular skill sets. And it's the same stuff. And a lot of it is 40 year old material, 30 year old material or 50 year old material. So, you know, the desire to do something different and stick out in a new and different way is strong. The, the reality realization that it works. The reason that everybody's playing it is that people don't get tired of it. I mean, it just works. The only people getting tired of it is occasionally musicians. So, you know, to pick a strategy about which way you want to go, we could probably play the sets that we're playing for a while. Will people say, ah, I saw them, you know, good show, you know, I don't need to do it. Or do people really remember? 
you know, I don't, I don't know that that many people come to see us two nights in a row. Well, that, that's the thing is like, you know, how often are you playing for the same people? And, and if it's, if it's not that often, well then, you know, like a wedding band, yeah. yeah, wedding band is a great yeah. example of, you can literally play the same songs in the same order every night, swap out the Forever. three requests, you know, and, and that's it. You know, you're, you're, you're going to be learning new songs as things evolve because you've got the the requests and that's kind of a thing with the wedding band. And, you know, every now and then one of those might be like, Hey, I, we should keep that, <laughs> you know, like that. And then that's it. Like, that's how the, the band evolves. And, and it's totally fine because you're not playing for the same crowd over and over again. And if you do happen to play for someone that has seen you, they very likely are hiring you because they want exactly the same that, thing. They want that. Yes. Right. If they're not seeing you every weekend, they, you know, they saw you two years ago at their cousin Eddie's wedding. And now I, you know, I want you to play at my daughter's wedding. And so like, can, do you still do that? Yeah. Well, I want that. You know, they, they don't want you to have, Oh yeah, no, we changed. Now we're like a, a, a death metal uh, wedding band, but you're going to love it. You wait till you hear our version of the chicken. Dance. Our version of, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, the, the, the time could be just as well spent on creating cool medleys or, 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 you know, transitions between songs or, you know, some kind of show to your show, those types of things. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. It's the eternal quest, right? You know, to get the, I, I think freshness is good. I mean, I, I like it, but I do certainly understand and have seen the value of ha just having a really, really polished, you know, GB dominated yeah. show. Yeah. Keep, you know, people keep coming back. People keep coming you know, what's back. funny to me is we, we play, we played a show not too long ago and someone hadn't seen us for a while came in and literally we were, some of the songs we're doing, we've had for a long time. And to have someone who has seen us fairly often come in and say, oh, I love the new stuff you added. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so. <laughs> yeah, not so. Not so. That's okay, though. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. So, I don't know. I, I'm curious. I, I'm, I'm curious to both be a fly on the wall and, and be the peanut gallery as well. While you're going through this process, I'll happily share my yeah. thoughts and, and I will fully expect you to throw them away and I'll be fully incensed when you do. So that'll be great. No, I won't be. It's so I, I heard a song from a band. I'd heard of this band the other day. Uh, I've known of this band for a while, but I didn't really know them. They're, they're, you know, kind of a, a new generation, but this, this um, vampire weekend, do you know them? Yeah. I, 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 I like that band. I've, I saw that I was at the South by Southwest. They're a really big deal actually. Yeah. I was there and literally throughout the week, watched them go from, I was in the club. I, you know, I got, I got word about them early in the week and I saw them with like 30 people. And then by the end of the week, there was literally a line all the way around the block to try and get into the club. Mm -hmm. And I saw them, obviously it was a packed, you know, packed night, but yeah, they're, and yep. I've seen them since then I've gone like to their, you know, when they tour around yet yeah, they're I like that band. They're a good band. But, yeah. But I, I just kind of like me, you know, I'm, I'm only about 40 years late to everything. So I, <laughs> I just heard some of their stuff and it's just, Oh, this is awesome. And then like, well, wouldn't it be cool to take one of the songs and, you know, and we have it and then we'll appeal to, It'll surprise some people, but it's a great dance groove no matter who it is. Yep. And but it's good to get some fresh younger stuff. And I actually wonder why are there not bands that are playing the best of uh, there's not cover bands that that would play that type of material and put a good dance show together where they could play the you know the festivals and the concert series that we play uh of of mostly like indie rock that's danceable indie rock. I don't know. I just, you just don't see it enough. It's really, really great it's, music. It's true. You're right. Because some of those tunes would work great in the midst of, you know, a, a, like you could, you could build a GB gig uh, with stuff that's new. I, and I realize I'm, I'm mixing definitions here, but you could accomplish the same goal of songs that people know and are, danceable and all the things that, you know, a, a GB cover band is typically tasked or expected to do. And you don't need to play the sweet home Alabama. You don't need to go that deep or maybe, you know, maybe you yeah. mix it and do both. I don't, but you know, like, the, yeah, 
you're right. No, no one's, well, I guess the question is, do you have to, right? Like the GD well, book exists the because you look it the exists. Videos. Yeah. 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 I mean, you look at the cover band central videos that bands post. It's, it's, oh, it's GB music. It's just, it's still sweet home Alabama or, yeah. you know, and there's anyway, nothing, I, I will say there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. No, no I, I sweet no, home no. Alabama is a, a, a well-written song. Mustang Sally is a well-written song. It, it's just, you Any know. song where you play the first riff and people scream and, and you know, stand get into up. it right away. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, but here's a challenge here. It's okay. If you're out there listening out there in, in podcast land, help us craft oh. the ultimate. If you were, if you, if you're, if you're 30 years old, what would be the, what would be the ultimate set list that you could play now where you could go up against all the other old guy GB bands that are getting quite a bit, at least in my area, they're getting, they're getting a lot of the work. It's classic uh, rock, classic rock, classic rock, or classic funk, maybe, you know? Yeah, right. But right. What, what, what would be an awesome set list of, and again, not, not, I, let's just not, let's say rap, let, let's just say rock, you know, guitar-based music, right? So what would be awesome set list? Send us your, I, I would love it. I, I, like I said, that I just got turned on by this Vampire Weekend. I thought they were awesome. They're a great band, and I could definitely see that working. Yeah, great yeah, band, yeah. great grooves, great, great, great grooves. Do you know about the Alabama Shakes? I do. Saw okay. them. They actually, okay. I play. I uh, I told you I went to that um, when Springsteen got the um, oh yeah Music Cares Award. Yeah, they they uh, they played uh, Adam Ray's the Cane at that, and it was they were great. She got was it. great. Yeah, 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 yeah. They they were another one of those bands that I saw it. Like the same thing happened. I saw him with no one mm. in the room at the beginning of a South by Week, and at the end, line around the block. But uh, but they were I, supposed to be the next big thing, and then and then I actually have not heard much from them in, in quite a while. Well, I think Brittany Howard sort of broke off on her own. Uh, okay, is, is she doing you, well? I, I I don't know, but I, I think that's. I mean, you could you you could see that happening right out of the gate. It was like, I mean, this band's yeah. good, but. It's her. She was a different level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, that's great. Like if it works for all of them and they can continue together, fine. But if she chooses to break off on her own, she's not going to have any trouble. You know, you guys are her backing band is, is, is how that was presented at least by that point in time. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, we've send got, us your, send us your song suggestions, you know, any, any kind of nineties indie rock type stuff that could actually be a GB set list for the next generation. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to share this with my family too. Cause I have, I have some, you know, 20 something yeah. in my house, not uh, pop, not Ed Sheeran, not Harry Styles, like, like no, indie I'm, rock that made its way through to the, you know, to whatever the mass listening audiences are. You know, I was going to say on the radio, but it's not necessarily the radio, right? Well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, the, the, I, well, and maybe this is a good way to frame it here too. I, my daughter, because of the, what she does for work, she works as an event planner and, and with companies that does that, uh, she winds up at a lot of weddings. That's just sort of how it works. And she sees different bands. And so, and she thinks about the music. She is very like, you know, I mean, she's my daughter. So anyway, uh, I have a feeling she will have some great thoughts about what this set list could be because it, that, you know, that would be the thing is like, what, what would work at a wedding for, as long as the crowd was, you know, I mean, the, the target crowd, you're always going to have parents and everything, but yeah, the under 40 crowd. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like what? Are, I love it. Even if half the set is that right. Like, I mean, for a wedding, you probably need to do both. You still got to play September, you know, those sorts of things. But uh, you know, what, what, what are the, what's the other half of the set list look like? So yeah, that's good. I love it. Please send in your ideas. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I love it. This is why I love doing this show. I'm all excited. I, I, when I got here tonight, I told you, I'm like, oh man, I'm tired. I'm worn out. Now look at me. Gotta oh, save you I, from that sting debacle that you went through. Yeah, it's just I, that I, drummer I, not always performing. You always be performing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, everybody always be performing. That's right. Later. Later.